Greeting folks, my name is Mamuji and you're watching the news. Having watched the ANC uh, policy conference that just occurred a few weeks ago, a month or so, there's one thing that I've noticed about the African National Congress in terms of policy. They are against conservatism, nationalism, populism, as well as adventurism, of which I don't think it's an ideology. But anyway, all of the reports by different members of the ANC in terms of communications, in terms of social transformation, economy, and so forth, the only thing that always okay was the theme of being anti-conservatism, and anti-nationalism and so forth. So we're just going to break it down quickly here. Here is an insert with uh, Gwede Mantashe first talking about this. Let's check it out. The policy conference, we're going to, to sit two strings that will be fighting there. One will be one that is putting the NC into adventurism and populism. And another stream that will be pushing the NC to be conservative and say, leave the status quo, leave, let sleeping dogs lie. And therefore, we begin to have a movement that fears change. Now, these extreme positions, coming. it is these extreme positions that are going to actually trample on the ANC, and the ANC is going to be the ash. So here, uh, as you can see, it's the, it was uh, the ANC Gauti Provincial Policy Conference where he spoke about the upcoming policy conference, which is already okay, where he says that there are going to be two streams of ideologies, uh, contestation. One which is um, conservatism and the other one is populism and uh, adventurism. Well, again, I don't know that as being uh, an ideology. I'm talking about um, adventurism. Now, if you look at it this way, the opposite of this, which I would think is the ANC policy or ideology to be specific, is socialism as well as communism. Because if you look at the ANC, they're in alliance with the South African Communist Party, which is basically a communist, a communist party. But they also say that they want to attain socialism at the end of the day. Same with COSATU, in the organization that represents workers. They want to get to what they call ultimate socialism, the ultimate socialism, of which they are against capitalism, as well as uh, your free market in rugged individual in, in invention or, or, or freedoms basically what they think is that the cure to what they call capitalism of basically which is really not a capitalism it's a, a corporatism you know where companies the corporate companies team up with the higher echelons of folks at the government and you find that it stops them from, it stops other companies, your entrepreneurs and uh, small and medium companies to being able to compete because they're not getting government contract or as we call them tenders. And uh, that's where I'm thinking the problem is with capitalism, but it's not even capitalism. Now, here he talks about populism as well as adventurism. I'm going to tackle populism a little bit because right so later on he talks about populism as well as adventurism taking charge as a vacuum of when a revolutionary organization leaves that vacuum. He says that's what populism occupies. Now for me, the advantages of our populism and nationalism, believe it or not, when a country's morale is low, economy is low, lack of leadership all over the show, 
people tend to want somebody who could rally them as a troop to say, listen, everything is going to be all right. And start coming up with popul populist slogans and nationalism, which is love for one's country, you know. And um, I think that's where Uncle Gwizi, no relation, you know, is off the mark. No, populism and evangelism will require historians of the movement to draw lessons from Fewer revolutions, revolutions. Revolutionaries become haphazards and deviate from systematic implementation of their own revolutionary program. Once we move out of being systematic about implementing a revolutionary program, we become haphazard and we become emotional, we become populist and we become adventurous. These tendencies from the, are used when a revolutionary movement is in decline. When a revolutionary movement is in decline and it seeks to regain popularity and support in a very cheap way, then it becomes adventurous and it becomes uh, very populist. We see that principles in that situation get replaced by expediency, greed, and corruption. And principles are thrown in the back burner, then expediency, greed, corruption become the principles that drive the movement. And one of the chapters that the Chinese Communist Party want to forget about is the Cultural Revolution. Cultural revolution. Cultural revolution was about nothing else but a, a, a movement, a liberation movement that was in trouble, wanting to gain quick uh, popularity and cheap support, get into the cultural revolution until soldiers of the Red Army intervened. Now, I'm raising that comment because that is where we're drifting to. You know, it's quite interesting that uh, Uncle Gwizi mentions the Cultural Revolution as something that Mao Zedong came with because of his organization was losing popularity. I mean, at that time, obviously, the guy was a dictator. So if you're a dictator, why would you then want to continue being popular? Because if you're either popular or not popular, it doesn't matter. The Cultural Revolution was one of the things which made folks in China to really perish because it killed a whole lot of people, millions and millions of people were forced to go and cultivate and have their own little farms to grow food. Some folks were taken from the city centers and go to the countryside to have a cultural revolution of some sort. And you see, this is what happens when you replace uh, pure capitalism. I'm not talking about your corporate capitalism. I'm talking about pure capitalism, individual entrepreneurship, where everybody has given an opportunity to be able to come out and have their own ideas to implement innovations and so forth. Here you got a guy who forces people to say, listen, this is a culture that I'm going to instill in you. I'm taking everybody from the cities up into villages to go and plow and be and be farmers. It doesn't matter whether you want to be a farmer or not. And we all know what uh, eventually happened with Mao Zedong because he is the reason why China now has one political party the Communist Political Party, there are no opponents. That Whenever there's an election, obviously it's just a, a process where the same political party nominates and chooses new people. So if that's what Uncle Gwizi is talking about in terms of uh, moving forward with revolutions, uh, and then this is just a total, total mess.